common elephant. Wales is a beautiful, peaceful, and inviting country, but beware of accepting an invitation. For just beneath the surface of this seemingly idyllic historic place lie stories cloaked in dark shrouds of mystery. Stories of treacherous deeds and deep secrets that some believe haunted to this very day. This is the ghostly story of murder, betrayal, and vengeance in the great castles of Wales. felt as though someone was standing right behind you. But no one was there when you turned around. Have you ever been frightened by an unidentifiable noise in the night? Most of us have wondered who lived in our homes before us. Who were they? What were their stories? Are they really gone? In the ancient castles of Wales, many believe some of the former inhabitants haven't actually moved out. They linger on, perhaps reliving their tragic lives and unspeakable crimes over and over again. In the southwest of Wales, one medieval fortress supposedly houses some very persistent ghosts. Carew Castle stands on a grassy mound above the tidal waters of the Carew River. For more than nine centuries, it played an important part in Welsh history. Our first story tells of a 13-year-old girl visiting Carew one Sunday a few years ago. Her family had nearly completed their tour when they entered the ruins of a grand chamber. As her parents admired the view from the room, she wandered away from them. The girl felt herself drawn to the remains of an old fireplace. As she moved nearer, a monstrous image of a snarling ape appeared. <gasps> Her parents could see nothing, but disturbed by their daughter's distress, they sensed something evil had been in the room. In the early 1600s, the castle was leased to a one-time pirate of the high seas named Sir Roland Rees. Sir Roland was known for a hot temper. It is said he exploded in rage when his favorite son, Ewan, fell in love with the daughter of Sir Roland's tenant, a lowly merchant named Ludwig Orwitz. Ewan told his father he would never give up his love. In a fury, Sir Roland told his son that he never wanted to see his face again. Get out! Ewan took his father at his word and left Carew. So Roland sunk into a black despair, raging with grief and anger. Sir Roland often arranged banquets for his old captains and officers. The nights were filled with much carousing but always there was a disturbing presence at the table. Wipe that stare across thy face. An ape. So Roland brought the strange foreign creature back from one of his sea voyages. He named the ape Satan, and it became his closest companion. One bitterly cold night in March, Ludwig Orwitz, the tenant whose daughter had inadvertently caused the break between Sir Roland and his son, came to the castle to pay his rent. He knew Sir Roland's feelings toward him, but worse, trade was bad that winter and he did not have all of the rent he owed. Orwitz was admitted to the castle and brought to Sir Roland, who was seated at the table, his ape in a chair opposite. Oh, dear Horowitz. He explained that he had only half the rent. 
So Roland seethed with anger. All the while, the ape glared at the guest. I will not stand here. Clearly unnerved, Orwitz put down his wine, saying he would not drink where he was not welcome. So Roland cursed the visitor and his daughter for bewitching his son. As for your daughter, Orwitz would not hear his daughter abused and raised his hand to the old man. For the insane Sir Roland, this was the final straw. He ordered his ape to attack Orwitz. Sir Roland blew on a silver whistle. With a shriek, the beast sprang at Orbitz, who fought the creature and finally flung it to the floor. Come back! Orbitz escaped from the room, leaving the wounded ape and the raving old man. Orbitz wanted to leave, but that night was so foul that a kindly servant insisted he stay. After a warm meal, their conversation was interrupted by the shrill sound of Sir Roland's whistle. Then came a dreadful cry of pain and struggle. When they opened the door, they saw lying on the floor near the fireplace Sir Roland's motionless body. The creature's face lay in the flames, its eyes still glaring, its teeth fixed in a ghastly grin. Both master and ape were dead. We will visit Gwydir, a 7th century castle in northern Wales, and discover the terrible secrets it shares with visitors to this very day. When Truth or Scare continues. Your adventure continues when Discovery Kids comes right back after these messages. Passed down from generation to generation, the Welsh retell ancient stories of vengeance and great treachery. But there are those who say more survives than just these tales. Across the mountains of North Wales, it is told a dark secret lurks, waiting to reveal itself to the unsuspecting visitor. In the Vale of Conway, beneath the Rock of the Falcon, sits the Gwydir Castle. The name Gwydir means Field of Blood, a reference to the horrific wars that took place here in the 7th century, the echoes of which still permeate the castle and surrounding land, according to Peter and Judy Welford. Well, it's certainly always been regarded as one of the most haunted castles in Wales, and this is something we'd heard about. And there was this curious room that was mentioned in the 19th century, the ghost room, and a sort of passage outside it. And there were supposed to have been lots of apparitions and a peculiar smell associated with this thing. Peter and Judy asked their friend Gary, an expert on the paranormal, to investigate Whittier. He came to Whittier with his equipment and immediately became interested in what had become known as the ghost room. When he checked it that evening, he said he believed a presence was there. The temperature suddenly dropped by 10 degrees, and the electrical board had short-circuited. Could it be that Gary had unleashed Whittier's many spirits? Shortly after his experience in the ghost room, the castle erupted with supernatural energy. One afternoon, Peter and Judy's neighbors were exploring the castle. In the west wing, in the passage outside the ghost room, they both claimed they saw something that stopped them dead in their tracks. Floating near the floor, directly in their path, was a pinkish, purple, ephemeral glowing mound. It seemed to move slightly in front of them. At the same time, the couple was overwhelmed by a foul odor coming from the nearby recess. A vile smell of decay. Not long after this event, Peter and Judy opened their castle to tourists. After wandering off alone, 
One man reported adamantly that he saw a man in old-fashioned clothes appear before him in the upper hall. The visitor was able to describe accurately what he had seen. Peter remembered he had paintings of the previous owners of Gwittier waiting to be hung. He looked through them and found a portrait of a man from the Tudor period who exactly fit the description of the ghost. It was Sir John Wynne, Whittier's most famous and feared lord. In 1580, like many men of his position, Sir John wielded absolute power within his estate. One day, his amorous eye fell on one of the serving girls, a situation that was destined to end tragically. Sir John's darkest secret was revealed when he made a dreadful deathbed confession at the age of 73. Sir John confessed that many years before, he had tried to win the affection of the young servant girl. She rejected his advances, and an angry Sir John became violent. In the end, the girl lay motionless at her master's feet. Compounding the heinous act, Sir John confessed that he hid the lifeless girl in a recess in the wall. He ordered workmen to break up the space, concealing her body forever. What of the other soul still trapped and destined to haunt Whittier Castle? In their quest for evidence, Peter and Judy continued to make even more terrifying discoveries. Next, on Truth or Scare. Your adventure continues when Discovery Kids comes right back after these messages. Though Peter and Judy believed from the beginning their castle came with ghostly tenants, it wasn't long before they realized that they were going to encounter far more than they could ever have imagined. As their investigations continued, the castle itself was to give up yet another secret buried for hundreds of years. Peter and Judy worked hard to uncover tangible evidence that would substantiate Sir John's deathbed confession, but they found nothing. Then, during a recent restoration, they made a fascinating discovery. As Peter worked on the roof, he uncovered an inscription that was carved into a chimney. It shows the letters I-W, then a heart, then the letter I. I-W stands for Johannes Wynne, that is, Sir John Wynne. But, as yet, no clue has been found as to what the single I stands for. Peter discovered the chimney had been altered by Sir John in the 1590s when it is recorded that he had major stonework done. Could that renovation have been ordered to further conceal this horrible crime? But another chilling discovery was yet to be made. Peter was down in the cellar, clearing away some recent flood water. As he shone his flashlight across the surface, he saw several small floating objects. When he examined them in the light, he saw that they were small bones. Soon, masses of bones revealed themselves sticking out of the clay. He collected about 200 in all and called the police. The bones were taken to a forensic laboratory and it would be many weeks before Peter and Judy would learn their true identity. Could the bones belong to the unfortunate serving girl? Then another altogether more friendly soul took up residency at the castle. Well, we've got two dogs, two fawn-colored lurchers. The story really began when a, a neighbor came over for dinner and saw three dogs playing together outside in the garden, and it was quite uncanny. And then the whole thing began to make sense when I actually saw the third dog, so-called the ghost dog, um, several times in the house. It was a solid dog. Eventually, the police gave Peter and Judy their forensic report, the bones. All 200 of them were those of a large dog, centuries old. The couple instinctively felt that their phantom hound must be the dog in question. But the police, 
thinking the bones of no further interest had already cremated them. Peter and Judy had grown fond of the ghostly dog and hoped to see it again. But since the bones were discovered and removed from the castle, the playful dog, Whittier's happy ghost, has not been seen again. In yet another part of the magical country that is Wales, is a story of a spirit so restless that for hundreds of years he has been terrorizing those who dare to remain in his castle at night. Next, on Truth or Scare. Paranormal experts say not all ghosts are as warm and as friendly as Peter and Judy's canine house guest. Some spirits are lost souls with a tormented past, locked forever in their homes with no hope of escape. St. Donat's Castle dates from about the 4th century and lies in the south of Wales. In the 1860s, St. Donat's was bought by Dr. Nicol Carn. From the moment they moved in, disturbances began to happen. Day and night, the harpsichord in the drawing room would begin to play, all on its own. The keys moved on their own, even when the keyboard lid was shut. Then one evening, as Dr. Karn was on his way to bed, he saw a shape move in the corner of the room. As he walked forward to investigate, a deep, evil growl came from the blackness. To his amazement and horror, he saw a pair of amber eyes. In fright, the doctor tried to retreat, but he was almost knocked over by a sudden blast of wind. He looked back to the amber eyes, but they had gone. Then, he heard a rapping sound on the window. Looking out into the blustering night, he saw the outline of a woman. A shadowy hag stood in a long black coat, beating against the window. She moved slowly away into the night. At her side was a black dog. Dr. Karn watched as they vanished into thin air. The Karns, in their desperation, called in an exorcist. the supernatural beings awakened, and the spiritual battle began. Bright light filled the room. The sound of music rang in the exorcist's ears. Downstairs, Dr. Karn felt the temperature drop, and a blast of wind whistled down the stairs. saw a vision of the old hag and her ghostly hound. The exorcist said he felt certain that the apparitions were connected to an old family named Stradling, who had occupied the home for over 400 years. Young Sir Thomas Stradling inherited the castle in 1735. Recently graduated from Oxford, he was known for a certain wildness. He loved parties and fun. In 1738, Sir Thomas went to Europe with a college friend, Sir John Tyrrett. The day before they left, the friends made a pact that if one of them were to die, the survivor would inherit the other's estate. It wasn't long after that fateful conversation that Sir Thomas had met a tragic end. The murder was rumored to have been committed by his traveling companion, Sir John Tyrrett, who had deceived and manipulated Sir Thomas into fighting a duel. The day before they learned of Sir Thomas's untimely death, several villagers had witnessed the terrible sight they knew 
foretold tragedy. They had seen the hag and her dog moving in a swirl of wind roaming the countryside. Sir Thomas had a life before him filled with all the potential that comes with privilege. His destiny was to be master of his great estate. Unhappily, youthful recklessness and one moment of bad judgment brought about this premature end. Ghosts of humans long dead. Beloved pets clinging to their homes. People whose lives were cut short by mishaps and misdeeds. If these entities are real, we may never know what holds them to this earth. One thing we do know, each of the stories we have just seen is believed by those who have experienced them to be absolutely true. Not in this world. So, who are the night visitors? The inventions of superstition? Or forces beyond our understanding? Whoever or whatever they are. Many people say they are intent on making contact. It seems like they might have something to tell us. Or maybe they're looking for answers themselves.